Hello, my name is Greg Delaney and I am a professor in the Department of Architecture at the University of Buffalo. Um, I also uh, serve as our director of undergraduate recruitment. Um, if you have visited the school before, it's likely that you have already met with me, so hello again. Um, but if you're new to the University of Buffalo and this is your first time visiting, uh, then welcome and I look forward to sharing a bit with you about the school today. Uh, for those of you that are seniors and uh, in high school and maybe have already been accepted to the University of Buffalo, uh, congratulations. It's a huge accomplishment and a really exciting time in your life. Um, and for those of you that are juniors or otherwise um, uh, looking into U UB for the first time, uh, welcome. And uh, as I said, I, I am excited to, to share a bit more about uh, the School of Architecture and Planning, who we are and what we do. Um, just a note, I am uh, doing this from my own home uh, due to the current circumstances. Um, so I have a virtual background behind me. Um, the virtual background is our freshman in the studio um, in Crosby Hall on the University of Buffalo South Campus, uh, which I'll share uh, more uh, on with you in a little bit. Um, that being said, I want to go ahead and get started to tell you about the school and I'm going to switch from uh, an image of me to an image uh, to a, a presentation um, that will give you some more information on our program. So let me just uh, switch that screen here and I will see you again in a few minutes. All right. So. Um, so here we are. Uh, so welcome. Um, this, uh, just to give a little bit of context, the image here is Hayes Hall, which is our home base, our main building uh, for the School of Architecture and Planning. I'll share a little bit more about the building in a bit because it has a, a very interesting history, uh, to say the least. So, uh, but here we go. Um, first, I think it's important to talk a little bit about um, who we are as a school. Um, first and foremost, we are a community of makers and doers. Um, what that means is that um, we, um, there we go, I'll uh, share myself with the screen as well. Um, we are um, uh, a school that is really um, interested in the concept of making and that for us is not just the idea of making at the model scale as, as most, you know, as many schools of architecture do, um, but uh, it's really about making and experimenting at larger scales um, and doing then, you know, testing ideas um, through making, uh, but also in our communities. We uh, really are engaged very deeply in the city of Buffalo um, in that context. And so, uh, so Buffalo for us and this culture of making, I think really define who we are as a school. Um, we have two undergraduate programs in the School of Architecture and Planning. Uh, first is the uh, Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Design, but we also have a, our Bachelor of Science in Architecture. I know uh, many of you uh, watching are probably here for our Bachelor of Science in Architecture, um, but I want to first talk a little bit about the Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Design because, uh, of course, we, uh, we also have some students um, uh, logging in for, uh, for an overview on that program. Uh, but also I think it's important to know that um, the Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Design is a program that we um, offer a minor in. It is the most popular minor for architecture majors. Um, and so that is another option. Um, it's also a, a program that you know is, is one that while uh, many students might not know about the Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Design in high school as a degree option, uh, it's one that many students kind of find through college and other course offerings um, and gravitate towards. And even some architecture majors um, switch into the major of environmental design as they find themselves at the university and um, uh, in term, you know, uh, and discover what the right fit for them is in terms of their interest. So I wanna first talk a little bit more about that program. Um, the Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Design is uh, a program that really I, uh, I think um, is interesting because it uh, offers a wide range of courses uh, across a, a many varied topics that all really connect to our uh, built environment. Um, it's the first step in leading to a, uh, a quite a lot of, of different options in terms of, of graduate school or you know, further higher education, um, or also many different fields and career options. 
you see here on this slide that um, uh, some of those paths include um, urban planning, uh, particularly in uh, terms of degrees, our Master of Urban Planning, a two-year degree at the graduate level, um, but also areas like real estate development, law, public administration, environmental planning, um, even architecture, uh, historic preservation, landscape architecture, among other fields. Um, it is an accredited program, uh, that our Master of Urban Planning is an accredited program, and, um, <clears throat> and so as I mentioned, many environmental design students um, go directly into that program. But, um, but really, you know, it it's, uh, offers a, a whole range of, of options. Um, <clears throat> I always think, you know, well, one question is, what is environmental design? And the best way I think, um, or, the, or the way I like to explain it, is that if you think about architecture as, as primarily being focused on the design of, of buildings within our built environment, um, although there are so many different things an architect can and, and does do, um, that urban, you know, uh, environmental design is a uh, kind of a field uh, of study that really focuses on um, really everything in between buildings. Um, that buildings are, are part of that definition of the urban environment, but that the, the bigger urban environment or built environment um, can t is, is a very complex um, uh, world. And that includes so many different, um, you know, qualities and uh, spaces and uh, people, uh, populations, communities, uh, neighborhoods, um, it, you know, thinking about the ways we move through cities and, and urban uh, worlds, the ways we kind of organize people and places. Um, these are all qualities of, of the built environment that, that shape who we are uh, and how we live in our day to day lives. And so environmental design is also about that. It's about community and, and people uh, in relation to place and how those places uh, define really who we are. Um, uh, as I mentioned, because there are such a wide range of course offerings within environmental design, uh, students really have the opportunity to uh, shape their own curriculum. And so, uh, so depending on your own interests uh, within that much broader uh, field, um, you really can tailor your coursework to uh, those interests and, and uh, through that pursuit. Um, and so you can see some uh, examples here, though, that um, the, the field also combines uh, or the major also combines work on campus uh, and traditional courses, um, but also marries that with uh, field work and, and site visits so that students are able to develop uh, a wide range of, of skills. Um, some recent student project topics uh, are listed here, and this really includes some of the things that I've just mentioned. You know, um, a big question for the 21st century is how to build more sustainable communities and cities. And so you see things like walkability here and urban health. Um, the idea that, you know, where we're born and the, the neighborhoods we grew up in really do determine um, the, our own personal health. Uh, that are part of that story and, and uh, is, is a significant um, you know, weight on um, yeah, who we are and, and uh, our kind of lives connected with that world. Um, and so it's just, and sustainable development encompasses a lot of different uh, range of topics, including also movement like transportation, increasing access to things like public transit, um, you know, moving beyond just sole reliance on the automobile, but to think about, you know, buses and, and uh, mass transit, but also things like bicycles and, and cycling, uh, bike sharing programs, um, a whole range of, of other modes of transportation that, you know, assist in, in uh, getting us, you know, to and from the places we go in our, our communities. Um, issues of reconnecting neighborhoods, you know, neighborhoods were very severely um, disrupted and, and uh, disconnected uh, in the mid-century with the intervention of, of highways. Uh, and so, you know, thinking in the 21st century about how we might more strongly reconnect those, uh, those neighborhoods or um, better connect neighborhoods of diverse populations. Um, and so we can think about greater integration in our communities rather than segregation. Um, issues of public housing, you see here also, as I just mentioned, you know, issues of race, class, gender, and equality um, as they relate to our built environment, and they so do. Um, and also things like community gardening, how we um, not just think about sustainability in our communities on the larger scale, on the macro scale, uh, but also think about, you know, in a city like Buffalo, how we might use, uh, kind of better use vacant lots um, that can contribute positively to our communities rather than um, uh, just kind of, you know, sitting there, uh, they become a, a direct resource. Um, also, just being in Buffalo uh, means that we've got um, an interesting region around us that is a binational region. 
And, um, and so that larger context certainly plays into our identity, but also then the resources that we avail ourselves to as a, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, university. Um, but I'll spend the uh, rest of the time really focused on the Bachelor of Science in Architecture program. Um, this, you know, similar to, as I mentioned, with the Environmental Design program, this uh, for many students leads directly to uh, graduate study, um, uh, for the most part in architecture. Uh, so this leads directly to a two-year Master of Architecture program. Um, we are a fully accredited uh, Department of Architecture, um, and, uh, and so earning that master's degree is an important part, an important step in pursuing licensure in architecture, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit because that is something that does tend to vary by school, uh, by program. Um, <clears throat> our program uh, really, you know, as you see, integrates coursework in design, history, construction, the arts, humanities, social science, uh, sciences, and so it offers a broad-based education um, that can also lead to uh, many other paths. So while majority of our students are certainly pursuing the Master of Architecture, either here at the University of Buffalo or elsewhere, directly from their um, uh, undergraduate degree, um, we have also students that are drawn to many different areas uh, in terms of career and further study through the architecture program. I always say, you know, architecture is really a very widening field right now. Um, and so because of the, you know, advanced technologies we are using um, in and out of the classroom um, in terms of computing and software, but also digital fabrication, uh, it really means that we are expanding the tool set that architects um, are trained with. And that leads to uh, more job opportunities, I think, really than ever uh, with a degree in architecture. And so as you see here, um, there are other options, uh, too, that students are drawn to based on their interests and passion uh, that they discover through the program. <clears throat> um, and again, a big part of who we are is Buffalo. Buffalo is a really amazing city um, to study architecture, to be an architect. Um, we are surrounded by some of, uh, frankly, the most important buildings in uh, the history of architecture, certainly in the United States, and some uh, very important on a global scale. Um, things that you may have heard of, like the Darwin D. Martin House uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright, one of his most important works, especially of the prairie style of his early work. Um, we have buildings by H.H. H. Richardson, which uh, is one of those is the State Asylum, which you actually see photographed here. It has since been turned into a hotel and conference center, at least in part. Um, and uh, the Guarantee Building by Louis Sullivan, uh, which is an early American skyscraper, really one that kind of set the tone for skyscraper design to follow. Um, fabulous building clad in terracotta, uh, super ornamental. Um, and so you see a wide range of, of really important buildings that have uh, a really shaped not just the city, but also shaped architecture discourse um, in a much broader way than just here at uh, in the city of, of Buffalo. Um, all of our parks and parkways were designed by Fred Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed um, Central Park in New York City, uh, really known as the father of landscape architecture in the US. Um, and also even we're, we're home to Louise Blanchard Bethune, who uh, was the first registered woman architect in the US. And so uh, such a legacy with regards to architecture, in particular uh, in relation to the first half of what I would call the first half of Buffalo's history, which was one, a really booming you know, time in terms of industry and innovation, um, as we were one of the largest cities in the country and uh, most uh, wealthy and prosperous. Um, but you, I'm sure, know that Buffalo, the second half of Buffalo's history is a very different story. You know, Buffalo in the second half of the 20th century was met with really sharp decline in terms of loss of industry and population. Uh, but for us as a school of architecture and planning, that is not a history we, we turn away from. Um, I think that that is what, uh, that's really frankly equally interesting um, as this first half of Buffalo, the kind of legacy half of Buffalo's history, um, because it means that there are big questions and challenges for the city um, that uh, we have the opportunity to continue to uh, discuss and, and shape um, and um, uh, kind of turn in, in new directions as we move into and you know, further into the 21st century. Um, and so some of that, you see some examples here. You know, Buffalo is home to amazing industrial landscapes like the, um, uh, the set of grain elevators at what's called Silo City. Um, and the grain elevators in Buffalo were actually incredibly important in developing modernism uh, in the field of architecture, particularly in Europe, um, because they were seen as such um, amazingly uh, powerful buildings, but, but purely driven by the functions that they house. Um, and we've got uh, really the, um, one of the greatest collections of, of those buildings in the world. 
Um, we also have really interesting neighborhoods of, of kind of curious and, um, uh, and, and different typologies, like the telescope houses you find on Buffalo's east side, um, or uh, buildings that are no longer used uh, for their original purposes, like the Buffalo Central Terminal, um, but, uh, but, but being preserved. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, as we continue to shape and, and consider questions about how these spaces are repurposed in the future. Also, some other amazing parks uh, and landscapes that come out of this, um, this legacy. Um, one of the spaces that's really been reborn that the school is connected to is Assembly House 150. And this is an image of that, um, of that building. It's a former church that sat vacant for uh, a quite, a, quite a, a bit of time. And um, it has since been taken on, uh, purchased by a professor in the department who then founded a not-for-profit uh, within the space. And, um, and it actually is a space for making uh, and learning and, and teaching. So a space for education. Uh, but actually education of the community, not just our students. Um, and so a program is housed there called the uh, SACRA, which is the Society uh, for the Advancement of Construction-Related Arts. Um, and you see that program in this image. And so you see all the kind of building and making that are happening in the large space that this former church offers. And so uh, these kind of interesting reuse, uh, reuses of space um, is something you see in Buffalo that the school is, is also a part of. Um, in that, I think, you know, I, I just want to go back to this idea of making because, um, as I mentioned, as a school of architecture and planning, that making is, is such a big part of who we are. Um, the design studio is really the core of our curriculum. And so students are enrolled in the design studio every single semester through our program um, from freshman year all the way through senior and then all, also through our graduate program. Um, the design studio is kept small, generally about a 14 to 1 student to faculty ratio. Um, this semester I have 13 students in my sophomore studio. Um, and the studio is really the class that uh, focuses on, you know, the development of, of, of critical thinking and also complex problem solving. Um, studio is where our students are met with some really big challenges in terms of, of, of creativity and, and, and thinking about space and materials and, and use and, and life um, uh, and ultimately towards uh, thinking about building uh, and buildings. And so our, um, you know, the, 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 the studio is a space where, in addition to all of our other coursework, uh, really ideas come together and are shaped and formed. And so it is the, it's the core of our curriculum. It's the class, I think it's the single class um, where architecture students uh, learn and grow the most. And so, uh, again, why we teach it every single semester um, and why that's a value of ours in our program. Um, the, the first year studio, um, uh, you'll see this is an image, a photograph of, of one of our uh, first year studios. Actually, the first year studio is all in one really vast, large space um, in Crosby Hall on the South Campus. Um, and you see just in this image, you know, the students working, uh, each student gets his or her own desk in that workspace. So you have, even from day one in our program, you have your own dedicated workspace uh, within the studio. And so while you see lots of desks here, um, again, remember that the, the, the students are then broken down into individual studios um, uh, of learning. And so that um, uh, sometimes those are in their own classroom environment. Other times they're in a space that is shared across many different studios. But um, regardless of that space configuration, you see in this image just how collaborative studio is. Um, studio is a place where you're, you know, you're working in interactive ways. It's a, it's a social space. Um, even if you've got your own project or your own assignment, you're always really leaning on your friends and colleagues in that, um, in that classroom to, uh, to ask questions and to brainstorm ideas and to have conversations um, after class and, and in those hours that you're working on your projects. Um, and so you learn, I always, you know, uh, say that our students, and then I can say, um, you know, speak to my own education very directly in this too, is that um, I think you really learn in architecture um, just as much from your peers and colleagues and classmates um, as you do from your faculty during studio hours because of that social nature uh, of the studio environment, what we call studio culture. Um, you see also just the density of models in this space. You know, studio is where you're making, you're doing drawings. Um, in our first year, we, we do still work with hand, uh, uh, by hand. 
uh, as a medium, we think it's important to still learn um, hand drawing for techniques and, and also just modes of representation and drawing types. Um, because then you're able to, once you start develop, developing skills and various software programs in the computer, which also begins happening in the first year, um, you're able to then translate those ideas in the kind of digital or virtual space of, 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 of computing. Um, and so you see hand drawings on the, the tables here in the studio, but you also see then the density of, of physical models. And so physical models is, is uh, as I said, a very much a part of, of how we explore ideas, how we test ideas um, three-dimensionally and spatially um, you know we think in a physical way in architecture and so uh, and so shaping those ideas through the model is is important and um, and that also means we get you in the shop from day one, you know, that the, the shop and those making spaces within the school um, are important resources that our first year students in their first weeks of, of class have access to and, um, and are trained in um, and ultimately have e their equal share in, in the use of those resources with all levels of students, even including our graduate and even thesis students. Um, and so we really see our spaces as a collective resource uh, for the school, for students at, at all, of all ages and at all levels. Um, this is another photograph. This is the one I had or have behind me um, as a backdrop. Um, this is our uh, also our first year studio, a space in the middle, which um, is sometimes filled with desks and more students working, but also um, uh, can and be transformed into a kind of gallery space. And so here you see student models being presented on these podiums. On the far left, you see a student pinning up their work, their drawings on the wall for review. Um, in studio, we work through a, a review process, a critique process in which you're constantly pinning up your projects, your individual work or group work, um, and then around and, and discussing that work with your faculty, with your peers. Um, and so, uh, and getting feedback on it. Um, it's an iterative process, you know, studio, uh, the creative process is a challenging one. I think it's the hardest thing to teach and it's the hardest thing to learn um, uh, because, you know, different from other maybe majors or course types, you know, there's, there's not always or maybe there's never a, an explicitly right answer or wrong answer. You know, we work in this kind of big scale of gray in between um, uh, uh, these two kind of poles in the spectrum. And so, uh, so it's always about kind of navigating uh, that process and navigating ideas and, and kind of circling back and looping around and, um, and you know, tying new strings and making new connections uh, uh, between your old work and new work and, uh, and pulling ideas um, uh, through in ways that that's constantly changing and evolving in that process. So it's not linear, um, uh, but it's really a kind of more nebulous uh, uh, process as you as you kind of move through that uh, move through design. And so, um, and so through that iterative process, you're constantly getting feedback from your faculty. So that that studio that you know um, student to faculty ratio of about fourteen to one is really important because it means you're working really closely in the studio environment with your faculty members. And through then our program, you're getting to know. Uh, our faculty so incredibly well uh, because you're spending so much time in that you know kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, desk or uh, you know small group environment uh, kind of circling around and discussing ideas uh, with faculty um, that you have that you know uh, direct connection with with those professors and so that stays with you through uh, your four years or six years um, and it also stays with you beyond that we are uh, very you know in touch with our alumni because of that strong relationship we build with our students when they are here over the course of many years um, through the program and so, uh, so that's also what makes Studio, I think, uh, uniquely special in the ways in which learning happens um, and that in engagement with faculty. Um, all of our faculty, we go by our first names, so no one is, you know, uh, a professor or this or doctor that. Um, uh, we're really on a one, you know, a, a first name basis with our students because of that, you know, close conversation that is happening in the studio. And so those kind of more traditional, maybe more formal barriers, I think, are, are um, uh, viewed a bit and also uh, just kind of behave differently. Um, um, in that studio culture and that studio environment. Um, you see the models here. So this is a kind of traditional model scale, but, uh, but I also want to show you this image because um, even in the first year, we have a history of really scaling those models up to a full scale. 
And so this was a project from 2017 uh, in which students uh, were taking those models and building them, uh, you know, one to one, full scale, uh, through our shop and fabrication facilities and out on real sites. This is actually, um, you can see there's a grain elevator in the background. This is at Silo City, uh, which is a, a great partner of the school um, that, you know, we work with so, uh, so often. Um, because of that, you know, just the inspiration of that landscape, but then also um, that it becomes a, a kind of space for projects to be tested and uh, out in the in the world and in the landscape. And so here you see one of those projects. This was called a reflection space. So it was, you know, the first year you're not, yeah, you know, you're not yet designing full buildings. Uh, but instead really being challenged to think about space and scale and materials and, and you know, uh, human interaction with space, um, how we relate the body and the hand and the sense of touch or, or seating, um, those kind of direct interactions with space and materials and, and light and, and so forth. And so those kind of core um, components of that, that really um, uh, together kind of uh, make architecture um, are what we focus on in the freshman year. Uh, and so that is, uh, and here's a kind of um, you know, testament to that working at the full scale. But also, you know, it's because um, materials behave so differently in a model versus in a full scale construction. Uh, you know, uh, uh, white glue doesn't hold up so well when you're, when you're actually bringing together um, uh, pieces of dimensional lumber or uh, plywood in this case. Um, and so, uh, so talking about how those things translate into a full scale, we think is an important lesson that students should, should learn very early on in their education. Um, as such, this is a photograph of our shop space. So our shop is such an important um, space and resource for our students and our school. Um, it's a 7,000 square foot space and it's actually growing. That does not include now a new space uh, called the Smart Factory, which is uh, more of an advanced fabrication lab that's alongside of our shop. Um, and uh, you'll also note that in the description here, it is not just a traditional wood shop, that our shop has really expanded its um, material range and capabilities to include uh, a metal shop and also a ceramic shop. And so we, we have the, you know, the kilns um, and uh, the tools for you know, ceramics or for you know, welding with steel, et cetera that really um, uh, mean our students are working in a wide range of, of materials uh, and with so many different um, uh, resources in terms of making. Um, I think this is important because, you know, as digital fabrication has become so invaluable and important in um, contemporary making practices across uh, the world, um, you know, a lot of, of schools have really been forced to uh, maybe diminish their traditional or more analog shop, uh, shop tools and spaces uh, to make room for some of those uh, uh, more advanced um, uh, machines and, uh, and, resource and, and tools. Um, for us, we have, uh, fortunately, in terms of space, we have not, and, and also I think the values of our school, uh, we have not done that. We have uh, been, as we've been growing our digital fabrication uh, tools, which I'll speak more about in a bit as well, um, um, we have uh, not done so at the sacrifice of our uh, maybe you know, traditional uh, shop spaces. And so those are growing and being invested in um, just alongside all of those new spaces for, uh, for digital fabrication. Um, I've talked a lot about studio and making, but uh, it's really important to know that, of course, that is not the only class our students take. Um, our students are enrolled in a, a wide range of, of courses. Uh, we have our students in uh, really more than twice as many major uh, courses as, as most majors at the university. Um, and so we spend a lot of time in the classroom uh, with our students, and, uh, and that's through more than studio. That's, of course, we have you know, classes in, um, in construction and building uh, technology. Uh, courses in architecture history and theory, um, structures uh, one and two, environmental systems, um, architecture media, which is really about um, uh, uh, exposing students to different tools and, and software programs and mediums, uh, media and architecture. Uh, uh, tools for representation, expanding their skill sets. Um, so, uh, so really, you know, uh, again, a, a range of courses that really round out our students uh, in terms of their preparedness to enter the, the field of architecture and also as they prepare for um, licensure exams and, and so forth. Um, in addition to these courses and the studio, we also offer an amazing public lecture series. And so the chance every, you know, typically those lectures are on Wednesday evenings, 
Um, they offer the chance for students to learn from uh, people other than their own faculty uh, that are uh, that work in the School of Architecture and Planning. And so in this case, we're inviting you know faculty uh, from other schools of architecture or frankly from other fields as well. Um, we're also inviting a, a lot of practitioners that are building you know uh, uh, you know that are architects in practice um, uh, working on on buildings and and advancing the field and, and very uh, interesting in, in different ways. Uh, but as I mentioned, because the field is so uh, kind of wide, we also look at people maybe with architecture backgrounds that are maybe doing new and interesting and different things, innovating the field um, uh, in, um, in varied ways. And so, uh, so that lecture series is uh, really a chance for our students to diversify their education uh, and their knowledge base to reach beyond their, their classes and, and faculty here. Um, and all of that really kind of, you know, stews together or come, you know, comes together to reinforce this idea that we're really steeped in a culture of experimentation uh, on the edge of knowledge and practice. And so uh, we think it's important that we're not just educating architects for where the field is today, um, but also really thinking about where the field is going. You know, we are now uh, getting farther into the um, uh, 21st century, and so thinking about you know, uh, uh, new forms of, of, as I just mentioned, you know, new forms of practice that are that are developing uh, as we as we you know uh, continue to evolve as as a, you know as people as a nation as a world. So um, so that culture of experimentation I think is really important because without that um, we're not really training you for the future. We're just training you for today, and and um, and so uh, a value of ours. Um, as part of that, our faculty are working on a really wide range of projects um, and interesting research. Um, and here's just a few of those topics. Um, so things like climate change resilience, you know, it's such an important issue. And, and I think uh, considering that uh, architecture is really uh, enormous role in climate change uh, and, and then, you know, curbing climate change um, is, is a value and, and something that we uh, want to, uh, you know, that, that you see through our faculty research. Um, things like gender and racial equi uh, equity um, is, you know, something that I think as we, as we look to and, and have really set goals in terms of diversifying our own, you know, uh, faculty and student body, but also just making sure that, um, you know, access uh, and equity are important um, uh, values, not just for the school, but uh, in the field of architecture and it's changing the way we also think about history um, and, and teaching other courses as we as we look back and, and open up those uh, those doors um, and explore those uh, those topics both uh, both in history and today and in the future uh, material innovation you see this is a project um, there's two faculty members uh, pictured here um, that have uh, worked, uh, done quite a bit of research with a local company called Rigidized Metals, in which uh, in this project they were really um, looking at this thin gauge um, uh, rolled, uh, so rolled with a pattern, uh, stainless steel that uh, to, which is usually used as a kind of cladding or surface finish material. Um, in this case, they're looking at that as a, um, uh, for its structural capacity. So, you know, folding it almost like, you know, origami, when you fold paper, it can become uh, take on structural properties. Um, here they're, they're scaling that up to think about uh, the architecture scale in relation to this material. Um, and other top, you know, refugee housing, um, thinking about, you know, our communities, uh, health and well-being, as I mentioned. Um, I already mentioned uh, construction related arts and that space you saw the image of the church, um, uh, ecologies, uh, and then also emerging smart technologies. Um, technology, uh, of course, as it's ever evolving uh, and thinking about how that is redefining the, the field of architecture moving forward. So uh, and this is really only a sampling too. I think um, it's important to know this is not everything, but, um, but just I think uh, a series of topics that just demonstrate that uh, range of, of research in the school because and while this is faculty research, um, uh, it does permeate into our coursework very directly. And so what our faculty are teaching is, is often, especially in kind of seminars and other electives, um, and upper level studios, um, it's, it's something that, um, uh, that really shapes their courses and, and their students' work. But also we have so many students working directly uh, with these faculty members on these uh, er in, within these areas of research. And so students, because they get to know our faculty so well, especially in that studio environment, it means they, they also have access to those opportunities in working for and, and with, directly with our, our faculty. Um, our facilities, uh, we are on the University of Buffalo's South Campus. So as you are exploring UB, um, uh, uh, 
remotely. Um, know that we do have two main campuses uh, for, the, for the university and also then our medical campus downtown. Um, the North Campus is really the, the large, you know, the main campus for the university. Um, that is uh, in Amherst, New York. Um, but uh, the South Campus is, is our home uh, for the School of Architecture and Planning, and that's on the South Campus at UB. Um, the South Campus is our historic campus, so you see a photograph here at the Pays Hall, um, which is our uh, main building. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, it's, a, it's an amazing historic building, um, really the kind of postcard image of, of the University of Buffalo. Um, and I'll talk more about its history in the next slide, but, um, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's uh, an amazing uh, a building in terms of also a recent renovation that we just, uh, just did for this uh, building to really transform its interior spaces to match, you know, uh, uh, 21st century learning in, in architecture and planning. Uh, but the South Campus, I just want to mention, um, the South Campus is uh, where we're located, which um, is a little bit different than most, especially undergraduate majors. Um, the South Campus is largely uh, a campus that uh, houses health science related fields. So dentistry, uh, nursing, uh, pharmacy, um, a lot of, of, of different medical research uh, areas. Um, it did also house our medical school before it moved downtown a couple years ago, um, and then architecture and planning. So we are kind of the odd one out on the South Campus in some ways, but, um, but the reason for that I think is a really important one in thinking about the culture of our school. Um, the South Campus is located in the city of Buffalo, and as I mentioned, Buffalo is such a big part of who we are that locating ourselves in the city um, is really important because it gives us direct access to neighborhoods and communities, not just those directly surrounding the, the, the campus itself, but also um, uh, across the city. Um, we get our students out of the classroom and into those neighborhoods and, uh, you know, day one even, you know, with our orientations as our students move, move on to campus. Um, and through so many of our courses uh, and also in our re in, in research. Um, and uh, so being on South Campus uh, puts us in those neighborhoods as a context. Um, we also, if you don't know, we do have a metro rail in the city of Buffalo. So, uh, and that is, that does run underground. Um, and that's about six miles. It goes from the waterfront uh, through downtown and, uh, and uh, many neighborhoods uh, following Main Street up to the South Campus. And so the University Station, which is on the South Campus, is the last station uh, as part of that system, that, that, that uh, line. Um, and uh, what that means is that our students can also hop on the metro rail and, you know, get downtown, get to the waterfront, get to so many neighborhoods in between there and here um, as a, a way of, of having easy access to the city. Um, we're also just in a walkable neighborhood. It means students do not have to have cars. Um, they can uh, kind of live the way we're also, uh, you know, uh, teaching and learning in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, the more di uh, diverse ways of, of, of you know, uh, moving through our cities. Uh, we have, uh, in addition to the Metro Rail, we have our own, you know, we have the city uh, uh, bus network, but we also have our own uh, fleet of buses through the University at Buffalo, and so that gives our students very easy access back up to the North Campus, um, uh, especially. And so, uh, and that walkable neighborhood includes a really, um, you know, a, quite a few restaurants, cafes, um, you know, interesting shops and, and a movie theater even, a full-size grocery store. Uh, so all of that is within walking distance from our buildings and from where most of our students are living. Um, so our students, just to clarify though, our students do have a little bit of back and forth between the North Campus and the South. Uh, we still do, you know, our students, as I mentioned earlier, our students are taking um, not just architecture classes, but other courses for, uh, towards their degree, um, both kind of those general education courses, um, uh, but also requirements like in, uh, math and physics um, that again, further round out our students. Uh, most of those courses are taught on the North Campus, and so there's a, you know, when you have a class on the North Campus, you're, you're moving back and forth a bit, but, uh, but we also work with our students to optimize those schedules. It's also super easy because the buses run 24-7 um, and it's a very quick ride between the two campuses. So, uh, so it's not something that is happening multiple times a day, um, but, um, but works uh, into their schedules pretty, uh, pretty seamlessly. Um, and ultimately what it means is that students have access to both of those campuses and all of the facilities on the two. Um, the South Campus, as I said, is the historic campus, uh, but it still does offer all the kind of things you think of in terms of spaces and facilities on a campus. And so we do have, um, you know, all of our architecture facilities, 
Um, but also, um, you know, there are residence halls, there are, uh, you know, there's a student union, there's our main library on the South Campus, we have a, a recreational facility, um, uh, multiple dining options, um, and so everything kind of you, you need or imagine at a, at a, on a campus is also on the South Campus, just on a smaller scale than the, the much larger North Campus. Um, Crosby Hall next door to Hayes is our main studio building. So we're really primarily in two buildings on the South Campus. Um, and, uh, and I'll show you an image, a couple images of both of those. So this is Hayes Hall. Um, it was uh, completed in 1879. Uh, but what's amazing about Hayes Hall is that it was uh, originally built um, not as a uh, university building, <laughs> but actually as um, an asylum uh, as a an almshouse um, and then also a, a kind of um, a state asylum facility uh, excuse me county asylum facility excuse me um, and uh, and so has a, a very storied past and and uh, an interesting one um, and so it wasn't until the 20th century that actually the uh, University at Buffalo uh, purchased the South Campus, what's today known as the South Campus, uh, which included this former asylum building. Um, and then ultimately in 1927, uh, uh, renovated the building to transform it into the academic building you see here today. Um, and so actually the clock tower was an addition in, the, in 1927, was not original. There was a, a much smaller uh, tower at that time. Um, and so, uh, so ultimately the, um, these buildings are a kind of uh, register on, uh, I think, the interesting stories of buildings in history and uh, the transformation of, of their use in time. Um, this was then where the president's office and many dean's offices were when all of the University at Buffalo was located on the South Campus, um, but then has been um, our home uh, for uh, a few decades now. Um, and as a school of architecture and planning, it's uh, also worth noting that we just are having our 50th anniversary this year. And so um, an exciting time uh, of, of kind of looking back and looking forward for the school. Um, the, uh, the building of Hayes Hall, uh, as I mentioned, has recently undergone a, a big transformation. So in 2016, we completed a full uh, restoration of the exterior of the building, but then also a, a, a renovation of the interior, really a big overhaul. Um, and you know, here's an image of one of those studio spaces that is in Hayes Hall. And so you can see how, uh, how different maybe some of the interiors are from the exterior. In the interior, we really took the opportunity to restore important historic details where they were, um, but to also then uh, transform the building. Uh, here in this space, you see the original load-bearing walls uh, were removed um, to open up the space to make sense for larger studios uh, and research centers, um, and we replaced those with a steel frame. That steel frame is exposed, and as with all of the mechanical um, equipment, and so uh, that also means that the building can also serve the function as a, a space for learning from the building directly. And so when we're talking about structures, when we're talking about uh, um, uh, systems, uh, building systems, we can you know, point to these examples because they're exposed and not you know, covered up as they, as they more often are um, uh, in this building. Um, so, uh, or in, in buildings. Um, you, but you also see the, in the polished concrete floor, another contemporary um, addition to the building. Uh, but you also see the really beautiful curved window wells, uh, window detail um, on their sides there. And so that was one of the really special details about the building that was restored and kept. Um, other spaces, this is actually in our attic. Uh, which was formerly sealed off and not accessible um, for uh, spaces for teaching and learning, but now is. And so these are studio spaces. Um, what you can't see, and you're, you're in that uh, really great structure of the, the roof of the building, um, what you can't see is that there's actually a skylight. You see a little bit of the, um, the, the light coming in there, but the skylight is actually looking directly up at that clock tower. Uh, so a really special view from these spaces too, because we didn't want to um, put in windows in the side and in the walls because that would um, radically alter the exterior experience, uh, appearance of the building. Um, and with the renovation, we also, uh, the building is now on the National Register of Historic Places, so it was important to, to restore that. Um, but then instead, uh, taking the opportunity of, of skylighting the space to then also look back at some of those and celebrate some of those historic details like the clock tower. Um, this is Crosby Hall, and you see it's located directly next door to, to Hayes Hall. Um, and so there you see uh, another historic building from 1931 uh, by a very important local architect, um, E.B. Green. And uh, this is uh, a, a building that 
has really great studio spaces with tall ceilings and uh, really generous windows. You can see how, uh, you maybe can tell how big the windows are uh, in, these, in these spaces. And so uh, a lot of generous uh, natural light or daylight. Um, and so uh, really functions, I think, quite well for our studios. Uh, we are uh, working on a phase renovation to the building uh, and more on that is coming soon. Um, and so it's also an exciting time for some of the uh, renovation work as we've done in, in Hayes Hall to now uh, for Crosby Hall to see some of that same, um, uh, same work as well. Um, in addition, we've got uh, spaces in Parker Hall, which is the third building on the South Campus. Um, that's where we actually have our shop and all of our fabrication facilities. So here the materials and method shop, as I mentioned before, 7,000 square feet. Um, but also adjacent are our fabrication labs, um, uh, both a, a kind of a lab that contains tools like um, you know, laser cutters and 3D printers, a wide range of different 3D printers, um, also a plasma cutter for working with steel uh, through digital fabrication, um, uh, CNC routers. Um, we, in addition to that, we have another space alongside that has uh, um, a water jet, larger laser cutter, uh, larger kiln, um, you know, further spaces for um, uh, kind of more um, complex projects in, in the areas of, of fabrication. So, uh, so all of this uh, really, you know, offers our students a wide range of tools to be using in their curriculum. Um, I mentioned living on campus, so we do, like I said, have, uh, have options both on the south and on the north campus. Um, on the south campus, we have uh, Goodyear Hall and also Clement Hall. Um, in Goodyear Hall, we actually have a, a floor that is just dedicated to architecture majors. And so that is uh, certainly the most popular place our first year students choose to live. Um, I definitely recommend living in Goodyear Hall and on that floor. I think um, uh, build, you know, further uh, fostering that, you know, building that community that is in the studios in your uh, living environment is, is only a positive thing uh, for our students. Um, it also puts you within a short walk to our, our main buildings um, uh, and um, uh, also just uh, gives you, you know, that kind of network, that, su that support uh, group uh, builds that into both your housing and, and in your studios and uh, people to walk back and forth with, et cetera. And so, uh, so Goodyear Hall is that, that building. Um, and uh, in addition to that, and about, uh, as I say here, about half of our first year students live in Goodyear Hall uh, in, on that uh, floor in particular. Um, on the North Campus, there are other options. At the end of the day, it's really our students' choice whether they live on the North Campus or the South Campus. Uh, pictured here, this is the Ellicott Complex, um, and that's a, a really vast uh, 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 complex of buildings um, where, uh, where many first-year students live at the larger university. For so, for, so for our architecture students that are maybe looking for that larger, um, larger first-year experience at, at the, the bigger UB, um, that is a popular option. But, um, but know that you have options on both of those campuses. But all of our architecture courses, or most all of our architecture courses, uh, and including all of our studios, are taught on the South Campus. So that is where our students spend the overwhelming majority of their time, both in and out of the classroom, um, because they've got that workspace in their studios. Um, as I said, you know, we prepare our students for innovative practice. Um, uh, as part of that, you know, I want to take uh, a minute just to talk about the different structures of architecture, accredited architecture programs. Um, there are, uh, you'll, you probably know from looking at or visiting other architecture schools or websites, um, that there are two common models for architecture programs that, uh, or two models at the undergraduate level. Um, those are five-year programs and then four plus two programs. Um, we are organized as a four plus two. What four plus two means is that you go to undergrad for um, the kind of typical four years um, and receive a Bachelor of Science in Architecture, and then that leads directly to the uh, two-year Master of Architecture, either here or elsewhere. Um, the other option, of course, in schools is the five-year program model, which is uh, uh, you go to undergrad for one more year than the traditional four, uh, but at the end of that five years, you receive a Bachelor of Architecture and uh, do not need a master's degree to pursue licensure with the five-year degree. Um, that being said, um, you know, I think, you know, I always say that, um, you know, as long as you're looking at an accredited school of architecture, you are on the right path towards licensure in architecture in the field. Um, but as all schools will tell you, you know, I'll explain kind of why we're four plus two and why we think that is a, a good model. 
um, and um, and and what kind of uh, kind of added benefits we think our students have because of that. Uh, one, um, we think you know rather than spending one more year as an undergraduate student, that uh, to move you into a graduate program at that time opens um, uh, more doors and possibilities and um, opportunities. Um, also, then with one. Overall, four plus two is one more year at six years versus five, but just with one more year, you're coming away with two degrees, uh, which includes a master's degree. And uh, earning that master of architecture, um, it does open more doors. Um, it's, you know, uh, on average, salaries are higher for those in the field that have a master's degree, not just the bachelor's degree. Um, it also means, you know, as I said, with architecture being an ever widening field, um, it does mean that you have, you know, a higher degree under your belt that that can lead to more opportunities because of, of simply having that master's degree. Um, it also means you have another year of learning. Uh, which, uh, which again, is, is an opportunity to further advance your interests and, and, um, and knowledge in the field. Um, you'll notice that we really organize our graduate program uh, through um, uh, topic areas of research, uh, what you see here labeled specializations and advanced studies, uh, where our students are then able to focus more in those two years on uh, pursuing their interests, kind of tailoring the education towards the interests of uh, a growing interest in the field, but also in our, in our students uh, and faculty. And so, uh, so, and that includes in that two years, the opportunity to do a one year long uh, graduate thesis project, which uh, is an opportunity to engage two, you know, for each student to engage two faculty members or sometimes three um, in their research uh, where the student is setting the agenda in terms of uh, a project and, uh, and interests and, and, uh, and research and design, uh, and then working with those, you know, selecting and, and, uh, and approaching two faculty members or, or more to uh, form a committee to, uh, to guide, help guide and steer that student through that process. And so um, that's also something that can, can really set students apart and does uh, in terms of, of, you know, moving into the areas that they're interested in once they leave the school and, and pursue their careers. Um, another nice thing about four plus two is it does mean that at, at the end of those four years, you do have the option of either pursuing those that two year master of architecture here at the University of Buffalo uh, or going elsewhere. Um, we, you know, I, I always say that while, you know, we're desperately you know, trying to keep our, our best students or many of our students uh, uh, here at UB, I think we are very equally pushing them out into the world at that time uh, and encouraging students to uh, use that as a chance to find themselves and, and, and find what school is the best fit for them at that graduate level. And so uh, we have many students that continue at UB, but we also have many students that, uh, that go on to other great schools. And uh, we think that's a, a, an amazing opportunity too. We have, you know, current or recent uh, graduates um, uh, that uh, have gone on to, you know, Harvard University, uh, uh, Yale University, uh, Columbia, MIT, um, uh, University of California at Berkeley, uh, SciArc, uh, which is the Southern California Institute of Architecture, um, uh, Rice University in Houston, um, University of Michigan, uh, Ohio State. Uh, so a really, you know, again, a, a range of graduate schools, uh, great programs that uh, we think it's, you know, good for students to also have that opportunity to diversify their, uh, their education. So, uh, so it's nice that you have those options. Um, and uh, for students that stay at the university, you know, continue directly on to the University of Buffalo, uh, we see that as an opportunity to further, you know, their interests and, and maybe work with faculty either that they were exposed to as undergrads or work directly with those undergrads, but, uh, but also new faculty that, uh, that they um, uh, maybe didn't get a chance to, to have or to learn from uh, in their four years. And so, so both, I think, are really great options, um, and about an equal number of, of students pursue their uh, uh, graduate work here or elsewhere. Um, the, um, the four plus two, another nice thing about our program and the way we've got that set up is that uh, we actually have a path that allows our students um, to, and I should switch to this slide, uh, but we actually do have a path that allows our students to uh, move, um, to actually graduate 
early in that four-year undergraduate program. And so that's through study abroad. So study abroad happens uh, typically the summer after the junior year. Uh, for most of our students, uh, those summer programs include a full uh, load of course credits. And so uh, that, that also uh, means a design studio. And so by taking a design studio and a full semester's worth of credit, it means that those students are actually graduating in three and a half years. Um, so graduating their fall semester of senior year. Uh, and uh, it's still eight semesters, but it's consolidated a bit uh, into that uh, three and a half years because of that summer. Um, those students then um, uh, graduate in the fall have the option of applying for early admission into our graduate program. And uh, from that, uh, uh, through acceptance, means that they're able to actually start uh, as a Master of Architecture student in what would have been the spring of their senior year is now their first semester in grad school. And so those students then are finishing both degrees in five and a half years, uh, which we think is really uh, um, a great opportunity because again, when you're looking at, you know, thinking about five year versus four plus two, uh, it's important to know that many of our students are earning both the Bachelor of Science in Architecture and the Master of Architecture in five and a half. Uh, in fact, it's becoming more popular for our students to actually study abroad twice uh, once in their undergraduate curriculum and once in their graduate curriculum. Um, and if uh, doing that, uh, those students are actually finishing both degrees in five years. So five years with a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Architecture. Um, that uh, it's interesting because, you know, of course, study abroad does cost more than the typical semester because you're paying for the, the program fee for those programs. Uh, but if you weigh in the fact that you're able to finish a semester or even full year earlier than, uh, than uh, planned, that also, uh, I think, makes it, you know, the kind of life cycle cost uh, makes it a more affordable option for our students. And we're seeing more students study abroad every year. In fact, uh, more architecture students study abroad than any other major at UB, uh, and we're uh, not a large major. So, um, so that's, you know, study abroad and travel is something we're always um, expanding in terms of opportunities to, to get our students out into the world. Um, and I'll show you, I'll talk more about the specific programs in, in a moment. But I want to just mention uh, admission and the last couple things here as we uh, come close to a close. Um, admission to our program, uh, into that Bachelor of Science in Architecture program. I know many of you are maybe seniors and have been accepted, um, but uh, for those that maybe um, are just um, beginning that path towards admission, um, I just want to explain. Um, and that is um, uh, a process, really the kind of shortest way to say it is that uh, your first step is to apply directly to the University at Buffalo following all of uh, admissions, you know, the standards set by uh, university admissions. Um, and uh, as long as you are accepted into the University at Buffalo, you are accepted into architecture as a major. So we do not require any additional pieces or, uh, or you know, have any uh, a higher uh, standards um, in terms of testing or whatnot um, than uh, admission to the University of Buffalo, uh, um, you know, uh, requires. And so, uh, so just make sure you're following their guidelines. But as long as you are accepted into UB, you are accepted into architecture as a major. Um, that's a little bit different from many of our, our peers um, as a school of architecture, um, uh, because what that means is we do not require a portfolio. So that's usually the, the question in that. Um, uh, portfolio, you know, for us, we think our, our mission is a little bit different. Uh, we uh, are, you know, part of SUNY, the State University of New York, uh, just one of two accredited schools uh, uh, of architecture in that system. Um, and so while there are many schools of architecture in the state of New York, um, we, we think it's important, especially as a public institution, but also just in terms of our own kind of ethics and values, that um, you know, we recognize that not all students in the state and elsewhere, um, that not all students have equal access in high school to the types of classes and resources that it takes to produce a portfolio. Uh, courses in the arts and in architecture. Um, and so uh, we do not think, uh, frankly, we don't think it's a fair requirement to require a, a portfolio of students uh, because we want to make sure that all students have, um, have uh, as, as equal of access to this education as, as we can uh, uh, make in terms of our part in that. Um, so that being said, um, we don't require the portfolio. We do, however, uh, accept portfolios and have a portfolio submission process. Um, but, uh, uh, but long story short in that, uh, the portfolio, and, and the reason is because at the same time, you know, as while not all students have the opportunity, we know so many students do and so many students are building portfolios and submitting those portfolios to lots of schools. 
uh, we want to see them too, and we want uh, we want to have you know those students have the chance for uh, for that review. Um, but because it's not required, it can it can never hurt you. It can only help you through that process. So it is not something that goes directly to admissions. Uh, it goes to our school. It goes directly to the Department of Architecture. Uh, so you submit that through our website, uh, which takes you to Slide Room, uh, which is a, a, a third party site, but that, that many schools of architecture are using for portfolio submission. So we find it's one that's usually familiar. Um, and uh, so you submit the portfolio through Slide Room. That goes directly to a faculty committee for review within the school. And then what we're doing is we are uh, taking those uh, portfolios and um, those, you know, best portfolios. We are communicating back with admissions to um, uh, to offer that um, uh, as as a possible consideration. So only those, you know, best portfolios. Uh, like I said, can't hurt you, can only help you. Admissions never knows who submitted a portfolio and who did not submit a portfolio to be able to weigh in in any way into that process, other than the encouragement, if it's a strong portfolio, um, that that can be uh, considered. Um, the other piece of it, or maybe the, the kind of more um, important piece of the uh, review process is that we're also using that portfolio submission uh, for some extra scholarship opportunities at the department or at the school level. And so we have our, our Dean Scholarship, uh, which is awarded to students uh, every year through that um, uh, portfolio submission process and review. And so effectively what the portfolio submission is, is first and foremost, it is a, uh, a scholarship application uh, in effect. Um, the, in addition to the portfolio, we do have uh, an opportunity for students that might not have a portfolio called the design project. And so there is also posted on our uh, web page a series of project briefs that you can complete in your own time. Um, uh, that, uh, and also depending on your interest there, so there's a range of different uh, kind of outputs through those projects uh, and media. And so that's another vehicle for students to still submit. Uh, even if they don't have a portfolio, you can still submit to be considered for scholarship. Uh, and again, for uh, through admission. So, um, uh, so those are some reasons why I, I always recommend uh, if you have a portfolio or have you know the the time to complete the design project or projects uh, that uh, you submit that material because, like I said, can never hurt you. Can only help you in that process. Um, it's uh, of course there are always questions about professional licensure and careers. Um, licensure for architecture is a uh, bit longer road than maybe some people realize. Um, it's really, you know, the, the field of architecture considers um, uh, license, you know, the road to licensure and the education of the architect to be a three-step process uh, or including three things. One of those pieces, and that's what we're focused on here today, is, is that higher education, the formal education of the architect. Um, and so earning an accredited degree in architecture. Uh, but in addition to that, your education is really rounded out through other forms of, of education. That includes work, you know, a professional experience, working in uh, or for, you know, in, a, in a, an architecture firm, uh, as you see pictured here, or for a licensed architect, earning hours in a, a range of different uh, kind of, uh, of tasks and, and uh, types of work that architects do from the design, you know, speculative design, uh, early, you know, initial moments of, 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 of working on a project all the way through, you know, even construction administration, seeing a project through completion uh, in its construction on a job site. So that, uh, that process, you know, the, that work experience is another important part of the education of the architect. Um, it is, ends up being about three years of work experience uh, that you need to earn hours through uh, in, a, in, those area, in those different areas uh, to then qualify for earning that license. Um, in addition to that, there, there are the architecture registration exams. So testing is, uh, is a part, uh, is a third part uh, of becoming a licensed architect. Um, but know that um, what's nice about the process is that it is quite flexible in some ways that um, depending on the kind of path you're on or uh, the place you work, um, you know, the, the hours that you're earning towards that, um, uh, that professional experience, you know, you are not really interning in those uh, as part of that. It is, you know, it is a paid and it should be paid. Um, it's a, you know, paid work opportunities that effectively you're just working alongside architects and other design professionals alike. Um, it's just that you're logging your hours, uh, counting towards licensure. But really, oftentimes the job, and the job, frankly, might not even be any different than a licensed architect sitting uh, maybe at the desk next to you, um, but you're working towards that licensure. 
Uh, but of course, with licensure comes more opportunities, uh, uh, you know, uh, more opportunities for advancement, uh, sal you know, uh, greater salary, um, but also then the opportunity to, you know, stamp your own drawings or, you know, open up your own architectural practice, independent practice. So, uh, so licensure is certainly the goal for, uh, for most, if not all, of our, our students, and a majority of our alumni do become uh, licensed architects, um, and we do everything we can, and our, you know, part of that process, too, uh, encourage students to be setting themselves on that path, but but, uh, uh, and to also then expose them to uh, the resources that they need for, you know, towards successful, uh, you know, completion of those, you know, hours and licensure exams towards uh, becoming a licensed architect. Um, as far as careers go, we have um, a, a ton of opportunities related to career development. Um, both in connecting our students directly with uh, professionals, with licensed architects in Buffalo and beyond, um, and in terms of, you know, uh, uh, not just making connections and finding mentors, but uh, but also in um, you know finding those job opportunities uh, specifically. So we have uh, uh, opportunities where where professionals are coming in, presenting on their firms and practices, doing you know talks at lunch um, uh, where they're connecting with students. Um, also, kind of job you know career fairs uh, and career events specifically tailored to employment uh, seeking. Um, every year we do a road trip uh, to New York City in January uh, over our winter uh, break, um, which allows students to, especially our and especially our downstate students to uh, to visit uh, for a, a really wide range of firms and practices, from you know small, very uh, you know independent practices to much larger uh, scale offices. Um, and the different types of work that you see at those different scales. So we're visiting firms uh, uh, both downstate then and uh, in our region. Um, we have a mentorship program. Um, so, uh, and also I always say that architecture school, because of that close you know, uh, relationship that our students build with faculty members, uh, through the design studio and other coursework, um, it means that, you know, in some ways that informal uh, uh, work, you know, uh, relationship with faculty in terms of, you know, portfolio review or getting connected with an alumnus or another professional or a firm through a faculty member, that's something that happens uh, all the time. Um, all of our faculty are reviewing our students' portfolios and, and helping them in that process as they look for employment. Um, and so faculty are also just an immense resource in terms of career development and place um, at the end of your four or, or six years. Um, just, you know, to mention Forbes, uh, Forbes has recently said that the top skills that will get you hired are these five things. That's critical thinking, complex problem solving, uh, judgment and decision making, uh, active listening and computing. And uh, we think that that really sums up studio especially, but really our education more broadly, very directly. Um, that it is, you know, through our courses that our students are really learning, you know, first and foremost, whether that's working on a building or working on any project or essay or other assignment, that, you know, critical thinking, complex problem solving, um, that that kind of uh, more, inter you know, interactive and, you um, directly kind of uh, you know, social and challenging uh, uh, mode of, of working and ideation is, is just inseparable from our education and who we are. And so those top two are our top two. Um, and then on, on, alongside of that, of course, yeah, judgment and decision making, it's impossible to not be doing that through the, uh, the problem solving and that, you know, that iterative studio design process, uh, creative process, um, active listening, computing, uh, again, skills that, that, um, uh, that are so you know, tied to uh, the ways in which we work. Um, you know, architecture, it is a major where, um, you know, you are not just uh, pent up in uh, what I sometimes call, you know, solitary confinement or isolation in your dorm room or, or bedroom or, you know, a, a study carol in the library, but it's, it's, a, it's a major that is, um, that is much more actively engaging and social in the ways in which you interact both with faculty and with your fellow classmates and students. And so, um, and so it's not a passive form of education, but it's a very active. Uh, form of, of education in terms of its engagement. And so um, all of that really drives these skills and builds these skills from day one in the first year design studio all the way through graduating, uh, be it from the four or six years of our programs. Um, and lastly, just to mention, I already mentioned study abroad, but just to say that 
you know, we're deeply engaged with that context, uh, both in Buffalo and in the larger world. Um, our global summer studios, um, I mentioned that happen every summer, um, except for this summer, of course. Um, but these summer studios, they change locations year to year. So it depends on faculty and, and students in terms of, of what programs we are running. Um, you see a couple lists of, uh, or a list of uh, a few programs that have recently run, uh, including Ireland, which also uh, goes to Scotland, uh, Japan, uh, largely based in Tokyo, but does quite a bit of travel around the country, uh, Costa Rica program, which is our longest running program, and it's a program that's really focused on design build and, and direct, you know, uh, work, working with the community uh, very directly in the cloud forest in, in Costa Rica, um, a program in Spain that is based in uh, Madrid. Uh, we've also had a Barcelona program. Um, I also run a program, which is a Europe-based program, so more broadly, uh, than, than a specific country. Um, and that's more of a traveling program where we're moving country to country. So uh, with the kind of pursuit of, of seeing as much architecture and as many cities as possible and, and a kind of building an experience of, of buildings and places. Um, that program last year, we were in six countries. Uh, we were in um, uh, Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. So, uh, so all you know across these programs, such a, a kind of diverse range of, of countries and, and places. Um, in addition to that, and, and types of experience, which we think are all incredibly valuable, all of the, the programs. And, you know, we're always, as I said, expanding our programs. We think travel is such an important, you know, life experience. Uh, but also just in architecture, the, the chance to, um, you know, get off the, you know, uh, get out of the classroom and, and experience things in a more firsthand way, working with people in places, um, there's really just, you know, uh, nothing like it. And so, um, so we're always, um, you know, trying to uh, uh, offer that experience to as many students that can take those. Um, in addition to our, our summer studios, we have exchange programs. So if you're looking for more of that, um, individual experience, more directly, culturally immersive experience. We have um, uh, exchange agreements with, uh, with a few different universities. Uh, you see those listed here, one in Aarhus, which is in Denmark, uh, one in Weimar, Germany, and then also one in Dublin, Ireland. And we also have students from those programs that, that study here as an exchange. So uh, in addition, we have, you know, a lot of travel opportunities just uh, through studio and other courses. We have short term programs. We've had programs to India, uh, uh, different countries in, in Africa. Uh, uh, we've had um, uh, domestic based programs that run over the, the winter uh, breaks. Um, we have also just travel, you know, in the studio this semester with the sophomores uh, that I'm teaching. We went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I took students to Cincinnati, Ohio last, uh, uh, last semester the semester before that to New York City um, and just as an example of my classes but all you know uh, most all of our faculty are engaging in some of those you know more direct you know first-hand experience even you know on the regional scale too to take advantage of, of the world around us and so um, uh, so we're always uh, kind of learning in these diverse ways um, that being said, I know I've talked for a long time um, and uh, longer than normal because usually there's more of a direct opportunity for questions. So I wanted to make sure in this session that I covered things that uh, in a more expansive way uh, because, uh, because you don't have that same opportunity in this uh, session for that Q&A. So uh, my apologies for running so long, um, but, um, but I know you can also and probably have also paused and done other things and that's good. <laughs> to have a breather here, but um, but regardless, there are still ways of asking questions. Um, one, of course, we have so much on our website, which is ap.buffalo.edu. And in addition to that, again, there's my name and email address. I'm Gregory Delaney, <clears throat> and my uh, the email g e uh, g l excuse me g l d e l a n e at buffalo.edu. Um, so please feel free to reach out and talk, you know, uh, uh, and contact me directly. Uh, my, my office phone number, um, uh, which is actually not listed here, but it's 716-829-5884. Uh, that uh, will